Well, hello, everyone. I'm Dan Wood from Draft to Digital, and today I have Ricardo from Readsy, one of the uh, founders of Readsy. Uh, today, we're just going to talk a little about about Readsy. We realize that a lot of you around the world are kind of caught uh, stuck at home, and so maybe having a little bit of uh, a show to watch and break up the day might be nice. And you know, I've had a lot of people asking about Ricardo since they know he's in Spain, and the numbers in Spain have been kind of bad. Uh, so, first off, Ricardo, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for asking, and thanks for for having me. Um, yeah, I'm pretty good staying at home. Um, I've got a nice terrace, so whenever it's sunny, I can at least get some fresh air. That's nice. And yeah, the the air has never been fresher in Madrid. I was kind of surprised, I was expecting you to be like out on your terrace for the interview, just like <laughs> showing everybody how awesome your terrace is. So. Yeah, it's you pick the one day where it's when it's rainy in Madrid. Uh, yeah. So well done. It's actually sunny here. We had rain yesterday, and now it's kind of nice out there. So pretty cool. It in. Oh yes. Well, Reedsy. So I imagine there's a lot of people out there who are have heard of y'all because you guys go to a lot of same conferences we do. You guys do a lot of uh, really cool uh, blog posts. You've got some courses out there. So I wanted to start with. Um, Let's talk about like kind of the main focus of your business is your vetted marketplace to help authors find their team. So editors, uh, stuff like that. So would you kind of talk about that? Yeah, for sure. That's how that's how we started. And that's the main thing. That's the main thing that Ritzy is right now, I think, and will remain to be um, in the future. Uh, it's basically a marketplace a curated marketplace for all the kinds of services you might need at any point throughout your author journey. So we started several years ago with uh, editing and design. And so we had a, a curated listing of really, really good editors um, and cover designers. And we extended that afterwards to illustrators, uh, book marketers, ghostwriters, author website designers and just recently launched uh, translators, literary translators for all the main European languages as well. Excellent. So as I said, uh, aside from virtual assistants, pretty much any kind of freelancer, publishing freelancer you'd need to hire. And with your vetting process, um, I know you guys spend a lot of time you know, making sure these people have the credentials. Um, a lot of your people came from traditional publishing, right? Who have like been laid off or just decided they can make more on their own freelancing and working with indies. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially on the editorial side of things. Um, I'd say that a good 80-90% of our editors come from traditional publishing. Um, some of them still work within traditional publishing, either as literary agents, and they have this freelance editing on the side with a, with a Chinese wall between the two, obviously. Um, then some of them are still editors at traditional publishing houses, and they take some freelancing jobs on the side. We actually had a a little bit of an influx of um, of like editor applications uh, after this uh, this fire situation started oh, because that, a lot of yeah. people, yeah, a lot of people are stuck at home. They have more time. Uh, maybe they're seeing that their future within the traditional publishing company is kind of endangered, so they want to start getting some freelance work on the side. So, so yeah, that's how we get most of our editors really, um, and. Since self-publishing is relatively new, um, it's been going on for 10 years, but it's still like compared to the publishing industry, it's relatively new. And we want people with a lot of experience across all our services, then traditional publishing experience is one of the musts uh, among our criteria for selecting editors. It's not the it's not necessarily the case for cover design. We've had a lot of indie cover designers who worked only with indie authors. Um, for marketers, it's a good mix as well. Uh, we actually refuse several marketers um, who come from traditional publishing because they don't. Most of our clients are indie, and what they used to do at a traditional publishing companies, like buying media, buying traditional media, billboards, etc., doesn't really apply to indie publishing unless you really want to spend a lot of money and don't don't make any money back. Um, so that's actually not a criteria for marketers. Um, but yeah, it is for editors for sure. Definitely. So since you're kind of an expert on the subject, um, would you talk about like some of the different roles of editors? Like for the most part, are people coming to Reedsy for developmental edits? Or are they coming for the copy edits? 
Uh, would you explain like some of the differences and the different types of editors? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we get we get a lot of newbies, um, so and especially in these times. So we get mostly people who are looking for an editor without knowing exactly what the editor is going to do. Um, but yeah, oftentimes people are under the impression that they're just going to need a copy editor proofread. So someone to look over the grammar, correct any typos, uh, do the formatting, stuff like that. What I'd say most people who don't have a publishing background think about when they think about editing. Um, so oftentimes we have to explain that the first step in the editorial process is developmental editing, uh, which looks which looks at the big picture. So if we're talking fiction, um, characterization, story arc, um, structure, point of view, um, all these kind of big picture elements that you need to nail before you look at the grammar, or the style, right. and the punctuation. Um, and if it's nonfiction, it's like the structure, whether your book, like how you carry your points across in the book, uh, whether it's aimed at a, at a specific market, um, and things like that. And obviously, if you hire a copy editor, so someone who's going to look at the grammar, uh, and then you realize that there's this thing called developmental editing, and you want to get a developmental edit done, then your manuscript's probably going to change so much through a developmental edit that you're going to have to rehire a copy editor after that. Right. So respecting those steps is, is pretty important. Um, obviously, what I tell what I tell authors is that you don't need to hire a developmental editor, then a copy editor, then a proofreader. Um, if you have the budget for that and it's your first book, that's great. It's probably the best investment you can make. But if it's, for example, the tenth book in your uh, paranormal romance series, you probably don't need a developmental editor at this point. You've got your plot pretty well figured out, your characters, etc. Um, and so you probably want to invest more in copy editing and proofreading. Whereas if it's your first book uh, or first book in a new genre and you're you're in a tight budget, you probably want to concentrate your funds on developmental editing and maybe crowdsource the copy editing and proofreading across uh, beta readers, for example. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Do you find, um, I imagine like editing and the cover designers are probably like your, the biggest categories where people come to you. With the cover designers, um, what do people new to publishing, um, what, are, what are some things that surprise them or questions they have or mistakes they make when they're, they're looking for a cover designer? Um, I think the first mistake is not looking for a cover designer. Okay, yeah. And doing the cover yourself, we still see too many, too many of those. Um, and we do yeah, too. I think the I the digital, like I, I love all of you that work with us, but please work with a cover designer. Yeah, and and I know some people uh, out there do their own covers, and they're great. Um, because they have a background as a graphic designer, but most people don't have a background. And right. one thing is being a creative person. And I think if you're a writer, you're probably a creative person. Another thing is being a graphic designer. They don't go hand in hand. Um, and even for some people with a graphic design background, book covers are a very specific thing. And yeah, I, I'm always telling people, you know, really look at what book covers in your genre look like because they, um, they kind of get special code to tell people, hey, this is the kind of book you're looking for. Uh, they, they have their own language to them. You know, if you're in space opera, you want to have a spaceship on it. Uh, if you're on, in fantasy, nine times out of ten, you want to have a dragon because dragons make everything better. <laughs> yeah, that was actually going to be my, my main point. Not the one about it's dragons, but about dragons. <laughs> How do you feel about dragons on everything, every genre? <laughs> that that would make books a lot better, a lot better looking, at least. It would. Um, but yeah, even, yeah, I think it's a really good point to look at covers. Even if you're going to be working with a professional cover designer, you should look at the top selling covers in your genre. Uh, first, you should know what your genre is, and then look on retailers and see, yeah, what the top selling books in that genre are and what the similarities across covers are. I'm actually doing right now um, in this free time that we have, a little bit of analysis um, on Amazon of like the top hundred books in a bunch of categories and trying to like pinpoint similarities across all the covers. And you find out that, for example, in some genres, uh, something like 98% of the covers use like uh, all caps for the title. Uh, in some other genres, like over 80%, as you said, in space opera, over 80% of covers have like a spaceship on them. So oh, it's, interesting. No, that, that sounds like it'll be great content. Like, that's a really smart yeah. idea to kind of go and look for that. 
I need to finish that. I'm curious if that will change over time too. Like, you know, if you revisit that a year from now, like, is that trends? Uh, those things are good to know. Like everyone should know them. So hopefully, yeah. Unfortunately, there's no automated way of doing that. Uh, even with image recognition, I don't, I don't think it's there yet. Uh, but at least, yeah, if we update the post once a year, it could be a cool piece of content, but yeah, it's, it's easy to spot like the commonalities, uh, uh, uh cross covers. And even if you're going to hire a professional cover designer, they may not know um, what the the genre expectations are in your genre. There are some great cover designers who are great at design, but they don't necessarily know a lot about marketing or genre expectations in your genre. Uh, we've you got should to probably always thing. ask them if they've worked within that genre. Um, exactly, that's a, a great. Um, and like for, for your cover designers, do people see like samples of what they've worked on before when they're going through like a portfolio, I guess you would call it? Yeah, absolutely. They've got a portfolio section and a gallery section where they can display all their, all their designs. And they also indicate the genres that they work on on their profile. So when you're searching for, for a fancy cover designer, um, you can just like browse by fancy. And if you really want dragons on your cover, you can search also use a keyword search, put in dragon in there, and you're going to get results for like fancy cover designers who worked on dragon books. Um, so you're sure that you're going to get a nice dragon on your cover. That's excellent. So we talk about a little bit about Reedsy's role in making sure that both the freelancer and authors are happy with the, the end results. I know, um, you know, not only do you make it a little bit easier by curating them, you make it so you don't spend so much time looking for these people, but then after the fact, just making sure that everyone is satisfied with, with that, uh, that whole, um, arrangement. So. Yeah. Um, because we curate, uh, the freelancer side a lot, um, we have very few problems on the marketplace. Um, both Excellent. because both because the freelancers are good and also because they're experienced. So they know how to spot like potentially difficult clients. Uh, so they don't, there's a lot of people, they send requests for quotes on Reedsy and they don't get any offer because freelancers are, yeah, they're, they have this intuition that this client's gonna create some problems for them. Right. Um, so that reduces risk a lot, but still um, in maybe 1% or less than 1% of collaborations, there is, there is a dispute or disagreement between the parties. So we've actually got that covered in our terms of use. Um, whenever we, we try to push people to discuss things between one another as much as possible. Right. And it's only in case you really reach a point where you can't agree on something um, that you can come to Ritzy and start a dispute, uh, dispute process. And in that case, we have someone from our team uh, who almost does just that. Uh, who looks in depth at the collaboration, uh, looks at all the messages on Reedsy, all the files that have been exchanged. And that's why we actually request that people communicate only on Reedsy because otherwise we don't have access to all the communication and the files. Um, so we, we specify that when you start a collaboration on Reedsy, we say just make sure that all messages that you keep it at least a record of all your communications on Reedsy and all files shared, because if there's a problem, then we can you know jump in and look into things. Um, so we look in, we try to mediate and, and then we come to a decision and generally, yeah, I'd say we try to come to the first decision. Uh, it's not always possible to make everyone happy, but right. yeah, we've, uh, we've had problems where we've had to kick freelancers off the marketplace, force a refund from them to the author. Um, and yeah, very, very rare, but it can happen. It's nice to know that you've got like a third party um, able to mediate in that case. Definitely. It's nice to have like an extra layer of security when, you know, especially when with editing, um, the costs are kind of high and with translations, they, they can be kind of high. Um, yeah. do you have, do you have a feel, I, I know this is going to vary a lot by project, but are there any like, um, just general costs, uh, like, do you have like a rule of thumb for how much editing in general uh, costs or how much uh, covers are, are costing? Yeah, we, we pull basically on a yearly, every year we pull the average costs from our marketplace. Uh, as you said, it depends a lot on the project, depends a lot on the professional, um, but we've got all the data. We've got data across 
tens of thousands of collaborations. Um, so we can pull averages and do some data analysis. And we publish that every year in a post uh, that we call the cost of self-publishing. So if you Google cost oh, of self-publishing, you're, you're going to find that post. We've got a calculator in there for editing. So you can say, OK, I'm developmental editing for a fancy book. That's 120,000 words. And we're going to give you averages. Um, for cover design, the average cost falls around $500, $600. Uh, depending on whether it's ebook only or uh, print, so with a spine and, and back cover. Um, you mentioned translation. Translation is pretty new service on the marketplace, but it's it's a service that's been out there for longer and that's actually consolidated a lot better than editing. Like there have been translation associations and and committees uh, for 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 a lot longer, and the professional like the cost for a professional translation is around ten cents per word. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of an established cost. Depending on the language, whether the translator is also going to do the editing and the proofreading, help you with marketing, they, it might vary. But generally, like our range is between eight and twelve cents per word. Um, so yeah, those are averages. I know both you and I were a little bit skeptical of translation a couple of years ago. Um, you know, a lot of people were talking about it, but um, the payout was taking a long time. Um, I know on our end, we're seeing an increase in European languages. Like we're selling a lot more of, um, so I, I think we're seeing starting to see a uh, a move towards um, other countries using eBooks a lot more than they have in the past. Um, for us, German for a very long time has been like our biggest seller outside of English language. Uh, this last year, it was French. Are you guys seeing any patterns to what languages people are translating into right now? Yeah, the first collaborations we've had on the marketplace were, were for German. Uh, we've had a small one for Spanish as well, but that was more of a passion project. Um, so I think, yeah, German is really the number one number one market uh, right now outside of uh, English-speaking markets. Um, I've been really surprised by friends because I mean you and I met uh, Twenty Books Vegas, quite a few mm -hmm. French French authors self-publishing in French uh, on on the Amazon French store, Amazon.fr, and making really good money. And there's actually a, a good group of those authors uh, making I think some of them the six figures uh, a year, which I was really surprised by. Um, so it shows that there's a lot of there is digital ebook traction uh, in those countries a lot more than the government or like official stats would indicate right. the stats that don't capture basically anything without an ISBN. So, so I think those markets might be, might be ready. Um, Amazon's move to make uh, Amazon ads uh, available in all these countries as well. All these country stores makes it very easy to promote books in those languages, and there's very little competition uh, for Amazon ads on those country stores. Um, Amazon ads are mostly like plugging in titles and author names, so you don't really need a translator for that. You just go on the local country store and plug in and take the keywords. Right. I think Publisher Rocket, you had an interview with Dave Chess, and he's going to release uh, a German edition soon. Um, so that's going to help your keyword research in German. And then the other retailers, um, Kobo is very, very strong in other countries. I've got partnerships with Fnac, for example, in France, Mondadori in Italy. Um, so they reach, you can sell a lot more in, in, in those countries thanks to them. Um, you guys distribute to Tolino in Germany, which is bigger or as big as Amazon. I don't know what the latest thoughts are. I feel like they're about even. Amazon okay. might be a little bit bigger now, um, but pretty close, yeah. Yeah, so the market is less... Amazon centric, maybe in this country. So you've got, you're going to make the other retailers really happy. I know that uh, Kobo is looking for a lot of uh, foreign language uh, content. Um, so there's an opportunity to be the first mover now. Um, you're not, maybe not going to recoup your investments into translation unless it's in German. In, in German, I think you can really recoup it quickly. Um, in the other languages, it might take more years, but right. when when the rise hits in France, like it's hit in Germany a few years ago, uh, you're going to be among the first movers. And that's that's always great. We, we definitely saw some advantage to being the people in 2010, 2011 uh, that were the first in the English markets. Um, 
there's a lot less competition and so they get a lot more visibility and that has helped them. It's not that you can't catch on now, but it is just a little bit harder because you're, you're going up against all this other great content out there. So we kind of talked about, um, you know, the marketplace is definitely how you guys make your money, but you guys do a lot of really cool stuff to give back to the community. And I wanted to highlight to everyone that you guys have a lot of free courses that you do via email. And so could you talk about, uh, some of those courses, because I, I know a lot of authors have mentioned them to me and I've learned a lot from them. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one of the things a lot of authors know us for. Um, yeah, it's a program called read, see learning. And as you said, it's email courses. So there's no, there's no video at least yet. Um, and the idea is you sign up for a course and you get an email, uh, an email a day for 10 days. In the morning, it's a short read, it's five minute read. So over coffee or breakfast or in the commute, uh, when back to the times when we were commuting. Back um, in the day, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's, it's it's quite handy and it allows you to learn about something new, a new aspect of uh, maybe marketing or writing or publishing in five minutes a day for 10 days. And it's entirely free. Um, so we've got 52 courses, <laughs> I think now, sorry. No <laughs> And Did you say 52? Yeah, 52. Wow, that's odd. Because I mean, you've got it's like you said, you've got the marketing aspect, you've got some aspects of publishing, just general stuff about writing, uh, I believe, and like how to d handle yeah. plot. I saw, I mean, just I remember when you started this, and I thought it was a cool idea. And then, like, when I was looking at it just before we started talking, uh, I was amazed by how many of them you have now. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really growing. I mean, we have the chance that we have a lot of experts on the marketplace, basically. Uh, so a lot of our editors have contributed courses on writing, um, children's books, cookbooks, YA, middle grades. So we've got romance, we've got specific courses for each of those genres. Then we've got one on story structure, point of view, writing dialogue, character development. We've got editing courses as well. Um, so one on self-editing, um, one on kind of more big picture editing, um, We've got courses on distribution. We've got a great course by Mark Leslie Lefebvre. I don't know if you know him on... Uh, Who's that guy? I don't know. Uh, used to be the Kobo guy. Oh, the Kobo guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we've got a course from the Kobo guy on Kobo on Kobo tips. Uh, tips for visibility on, on Kobo. It's pretty cool. We've got a course from another of the best beards in publishing, David Gogren, on book ads. Um, so I, I feel, I feel there. like that's a blog post right there. The, the top 10 beards and publishing, although mine right now, I don't know if mine would make it, but David's and yours are in top shape. No, but it's, it's nicely trimmed. So, you know, it'd be in the nicely trimmed category. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, we keep adding more, um, and I've written several myself on the marketing end of things like Facebook ads, Amazon ads, which I have to update pretty often, uh, which is a bit of oh, a pain. Bet. That, that's just always changing, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Thankfully, it's not a video course. So we have a few screenshots in there that we change when the interface changes, cool. but not everything. So, so yeah, it's a way of giving back. It's a way also... You mentioned, yeah, the retail marketplace is where we make our money and in order to be able to use a retail marketplace, you have to be a little bit savvy as an author. Uh, we're not selling a package where we're going to do everything for you. Uh, you have to come in, search for an editor, search for your cover designer. Um, so we want to arm people, arm authors who are really serious about this with the knowledge they need to be able to choose the right editor. Um, I always believe that if you're going to hire a marketer, you should already know things about marketing yourself. So I always, first thing is I tell people, take some free courses and then set up some ads and if you see some traction maybe hire a pro to help you with those ads uh, help you learn them better but there's no point hiring someone to do everything for you because no one's going to do that uh, i hear that over and over how dangerous it is just to try to hand off your marketing you need to really understand what they're doing even if you can't do it as well as i can you need to try to be following along uh, for the future absolutely Let's talk about uh, the other awesome free tool you guys have that I, I hear about a lot in like groups and at conferences is your uh, book editor. 
uh, which can help people do the conversion. You can actually write in it. I know you guys have some future plans to help uh, collaborative writing or working with an editor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, it's, as you mentioned, it's a writing tool really now. Um, so kind of distraction free writing tool um, that's meant for books. So you've got kind of chapters on the left sidebar. You can organize it in parts. We've got front matter and back matter as well. Um, we've got the, all the parts of the front matter hard coded in there. Um, so you don't have to figure out whether the epigraph comes before the introduction or the preface of the foreword. Uh, or the table of contents. We've got all of that in there in the right order. Uh, you can just take the parts you want. Um, and you write your book in there. You can export a Word document if you want to work with an editor. Um, and when you're ready to publish, you can just export uh, an EPUB and movie or a print ready PDF. Excellent. Um, and yeah, similar to kind of the export options or the formatting options you have with your updated tool templates free tool. Um, so you might as well take advantage of it if you haven't bought Vellum already. I agree. Uh, you know, I kind of partial to the draft to digital one since we've built it. However, <laughs> I do hear a lot of people out there that use the Readsy one and you've got two great free tools to try and see if they work for your needs before you spend exactly. any money. Um, you know, I, I do hear great things about Vellum all the time. You know, outside of Vellum, ours, and Reedsy's editors, I wouldn't really even look at many of the others unless you have a very specific need. Um, I, I think they're definitely the the best ones out there. Um, what's the next? Oh, Reedsy Discovery. So this is something new. So I wanted to make sure we talked a little bit about it. Uh, we've got about five minutes before we're going to start taking a few questions from the audience. So. Yeah, Reads the Discovery, it's, uh, it's new. I mean, it's been going on for a year, but we were kind of slow rolling it. Uh, and the idea is to provide um, a, a little bit like Books to Read, uh, a new promotional avenue for authors. Um, so the way it works is we've got a community of reviewers, um, which we curate, same as our editors, proofreaders, et cetera. And then we've got a community of readers. And what we do is you submit your book in advance. So it's only for, for new releases of books that have been recently released. So you, you submit your book and you set um, to reach a discovery and you set a, a discovery launch date, which can be the same as your book's launch date or a little bit before, a little bit uh, later. It's up to you. We've got some people who've used it for crowdfunding projects as well. So they put another link to Kickstarter, uh, pre-order. We've got people who've use it to revive something that's been published a few months ago. So all that's valid. Uh, and what we do, so you pay $50 for the submission to submit to Ritzy Discovery. And what that gets you is we make the book available. Uh, we make one advanced review copy available to our reviewers, to our reviewer pool. Um, so when a reviewer picks it up, it disappears from the review pool. So you can only get one review from a reviewer. But what we do is uh, that reviewer has to commit to leave a review before your discovery launch date. And then um, that review gets in. If it's, a, if it's a positive review, there's no guarantee, there's no guarantee that's going to be a positive review. But if it's a positive review, then uh, we'll give it a lot of exposure to, to readers on your discovery launch date. So we'll go live in our discovery feed, where we've got uh, quite a few readers browsing that every day. Excellent. And, and yeah, we encourage authors to to tell their readers to upvote their books in there. And every week, the top books in terms of reviews and upvotes uh, made it made it, uh, make it to our weekly discovery newsletter. Um, so that's that's kind of the author side. Um, and our goal with discovery is to really turn into kind of a new Goodreads because it hasn't been updated in years. Goodreads. Oh so, man, yeah, Amazon just kind of let Goodreads go yeah. to hell. Yeah, and I, it's still used by millions of people uh, around the world. So we think, I mean, there's clearly a need for something like that. Definitely. Um, so we're kind of trying to provide an alternative. Just today, we launched uh, the library feature on Discovery. So as a reader, you can go in there and add books to your library that you've read or that you want to read. So we've basically replicated the the add to bookshelf feature that you have on Goodreads in a much, much, much nicer way. Oh, very um, cool. 
So, so yeah, we're, our goal is basically to build a, a big reader community in there that authors can tap into via reviewers. Very cool. I've gone ahead and flipped over to, uh, I've got the uh, web address for Readsy, so you guys should definitely check that out at some point, um, which is just www.readsy, which is R-E-E-D-S-Y.com. So give that, uh, check that out. Start with a question here from AmTV, uh, which is hi, this is Angelina. Angeline Bishop I was wondering who's behind Reedsy's bestseller podcast, which is a very cool podcast. Yeah, I checked it out. Like very well produced and well done. Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, we can. <laughs> it's one of those things I forget to talk about on 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 podcasts and <laughs> and interviews like this because uh, we can really cover everything. Uh, it was actually it's uh, it was an initiative from one of our interns a few a couple of years ago, Casimir. Casimir M. Stone, and we ended up hiring him full time for that, and then he moved on as a freelancer. So we've we've just hired him as a freelancer. So it's his his creation. Um, we kind of find authors uh, for him to interview um, from our Ritzy community, and yeah, he produces kind of um, he produces it in series. So we've got four series out, and it's there's a lot of storytelling. It's not just um, an interview with the author. He does interviews, but then he mixes it in in a whole narrative and takes in bits from what they've said and adds a lot of narration in there. So it's very different from the podcast you have out there. I know some people love it. Some others don't like it. It's just something different. There are so many great publishing podcasts out there. We didn't want to add just another another similar one. We wanted to do something different. And and yeah, Casimir M. Stone is the guy behind it. I checked it. I really liked the first season. And then I get, I just kind of forgot about it. And so I've been meaning to check out uh, the rest of the seasons. We had a comment, which I think was in reference to your uh, to Discovery from Delilah. It needs to be at least five weeks from the date you submit your book. Is that, uh, am, I, am, I, am I interpreting that right? Yeah, that's correct. So you you need to when you submit your book to Reads Discovery, your discovery launch date has has to be like uh, five weeks, um, five weeks later. Because uh, we've kind of determined like from testing in the early days, it was I think we only had two or four weeks, uh, and we've seen that most reviewers need a longer time to pick up a book. Uh, even if they're indie reviewers and stuff. Um, and also in some cases, you know, especially in in these times, a reviewer picks up a book, uh, then falls ill or whatever, uh, right. and has to put the book back in the review pool. So that allows extra time for someone else to pick it up and review it. Um, I know that some of the, um, like Library Journal, um, Publishers Weekly, some of the places out there that give um, professional reviews, um, you know, have like days, like three months. And so that like, that's really five weeks is not bad. And, um, you know, we're seeing more indies, like I would say early on, a lot of indies, you know, they'd finish a book, they would get it edited and they would publish it uh, immediately. Um, that seems yeah. to be less the case now where people are starting to try to coordinate, uh, review things like that. They're trying to coordinate uh, audiobooks in some cases and print books. Um, and so, that's kind of cool to see uh, the longer pe people that are just planning things better. Yeah. And rapid releases as well. Definitely. I had a, a question from uh, our own Kevin Tomlinson. Uh, when it comes to marketing, how far does it go? Are there any done for you services? And if so, are there any guarantees on results? Um, it's a tough one. Uh, on the guarantee side, no, there's really going to be any guarantee on results. Um, and on the how far does it go, it depends. So you're basically hiring people on Read C, uh, on the marketing side of things. So we've got people separated and separated. Um, we can we let our marketers choose between three different services. One is marketing strategy. So that's for someone who just wants a marketing plan for a new release or just wants um, to brainstorm about marketing ideas or wants an audit on kind of They've got books out there they aren't selling. They want to know why. Uh, so that's great examples of like situations in which you'd hire a professional marketer for like 
marketing strategy. Then we've got people specializing in email marketing. So if you want, if you don't want to set up your mailing list yourself, but you want someone to do it for you, uh, set up a welcome automation and all that, then we've got people who specialize in that. So tips for email marketing. Basically, if you don't want to read Newsletter Ninja uh, by Tamil Brack and you want someone to do it for you, which I don't necessarily recommend. It depends on like how much time you have and how much money you have, you know? Uh, it's a little bit better to have your own voice to it, I believe. Um, to yeah, you. definitely. Uh, it's I've done it for a few authors myself, and generally I leave places where they can add their own voice. Like I tell them this is a structure that I'd recommend, and here you write a paragraph in your own voice. Um, so that's one thing. Then we've got advertisers, so people who specialize in advertising. Generally, they're not going to run the ads for you forever. Um, they would they would either work around special promotions or run ads for you for a specific time period, or teach you how to do ads. So they set up the ads, um, work with you on them for a couple of months, and then leave you with the the tools to take over, basically, and the tools and the knowledge to take over. So these are the kind of main categories, and and yeah, it's really a guarantee in terms of results. Some of them, because they're experienced, I'll be able to tell you, okay, based on your cover, your reviews and all that, I think that if we do a price promo, we book these sites and we spend this much money on Facebook, then you can get into the top five of your category. It's not a guarantee, but that's kind of an objective uh, yeah. for the marketer to reach. So sticking with the marketing theme, uh, Amanda Lee, our good friend. Hi, Amanda. Hey, uh, she says, uh, what are you seeing with advertising right now? Facebook seems to be doing better, even in limited genres than it was before. Uh, I know you on the side kind of run some ads for people. It, it might be a little bit early to really pull a lot of, uh, make a lot of assumptions about how things are working now, but just your thoughts um, on are, are things working that weren't working or are things working differently in the age of Corona? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's not too early to to draw conclusions. Like Facebook ads have never been cheaper right now. It's kind of crazy across the board. Uh, I see it for our retail. Oh, ads. yeah, because you're not competing with all of the physical goods, I imagine. Like so many exactly. businesses. Exactly. Interesting. You, and a lot of, uh, um, yeah, a lot of the, the big brands and the big companies, they usually use marketing agencies. So they contract out their ads to marketing agencies. And the first thing you're going to cut uh, in, in times of crisis or potential crisis is kind of the agencies you use. So there's a lot less competition on Facebook now. Um, and so I wrote that in my, in my last uh, weekly newsletter, Retail Marketing Newsletter. But basically, if you look at the three main advertising platforms for authors, two of them, Amazon Ads and BookBub Ads, you're competing mostly against authors and publishers. Um, on Amazon, obviously, all brands advertise on Amazon. But if we're looking at the books and Kindle store sections, it's only authors and publishers advertising in there. And there's just as many people advertising there as there were before, I think. Um, same for BookBub. Whereas on Facebook, even to reach like specific people who are fans of, like for example, Stephen King, these people are also going to be fans of other, as you said, uh, other brands and other physical products. So you're actually not just bidding against authors and publishers to reach those people, you're, you're bidding against a, a big number of companies, the majority of which are not advertising right now during these times of Corona. So definitely get on the Facebook ads wagon. It's one of the best times ever to, to be testing ads on there. So do you guys have a one of your email courses on Facebook ads or is it like a more general one? No, we've got a specific one written by myself on Facebook oh, ads. I would definitely check that out then. Um, yeah, other good sources we know of, a lot of people have said very good things about Mark Dawson's course on Facebook mm -hmm. ads, which I don't think is always available. Um, is there anyone else you would recommend on Facebook ads? Um, in the industry, let me think. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, Mal Cooper's book on. I can remember. Yeah, one on Facebook ads, or is it just Amazon ads? Or I guess he does both, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. The they're both. They're no. There's one on like launch, I think. Yeah. That they just co-released, and they're the they have the the old one which they did a new edition of. 
Help My Facebook Ads Suck. That's the title. Help My Facebook Ads Suck. Really, really good book, especially the new edition. It has like stuff on funnel strategies, um, retargeting, video, all that. And it has one of the most awesome chapters on read through. Um, so, so yeah, really good book to be checking out. Had one from Crystal. I use Wattpad where I write small stories and use it also to promote my self-published work. I've gotten sales. What are other recommendations to promote one's book without hiring a professional? Um, so yeah, we just talked about Facebook ads right now. If you're ever going to try ads, and now is the time to to try them on Facebook. Um, Amazon book by ads are other alternatives as well. I generally, what I generally say is the three platforms are pretty different in how they work. Um, so if you test all three, you're probably going to develop an affinity for one of the three, and that's where you should focus your probably your spend on. You got to be really like it has to be somewhat fun for you to go in and create ads, and you got to really understand how the platform works. Uh, me, I I really hate Amazon. I can run ads in there, but I'm not the best at it because I don't I don't really understand how it works. Uh, right. it, it doesn't make a lot of logical sense to me. Whereas I understand Facebook and to some to some extent BookBub. So you got to find that platform. And other ways, um, there are fifth, there are hundreds of ways. Like we've got a blog post on 50 book marketing ideas. Bookbub's, BookBub's got a blog post on 100 book marketing ideas. So just Google book marketing ideas, and you're going to find. And a lot of other ideas. So much of it, just know where your readers are. Like the best, the best way in this industry to just dominate is to know your readers as well as possible. Um, I know with fantasy, there's a big uh, Reddit has a big subreddit about fantasy. I see a lot of uh, indie authors there and being a part of the community. Um, Wattpad that you mentioned is a great way, especially to meet younger readers. Um, there's a couple other services out there like Wattpad that cater to specific things. And so, um, yeah, like how awesome is it that so many of us have jobs that let us work from home relatively easy as opposed to, um, you know, like 90% of the people out there in the world. Um, I had one from Mark, the, uh, former Kobo guy now drafted digital's director of business development. And I think that's a good one because uh, I, yeah, I know people, I know you guys put a lot of thought into this and into, into your <laughs> logo. So how'd you come up with a name for the company? And I want to add the logo question in there too. Yeah, really good question. Um, so we had a long list of names and it's pretty hard to come up with a, a company name that, um, that has some relation to what your company does and has it the really is. available. Yeah. It is. Very hard, and and also that's short, you know. Um, so uh, we don't know because we picked one that was ridiculously long. <laughs> At least it has something well, to do with what we do. Uh, like draft to digital is literally what we do, but exactly. Yeah, and it's and you turn it into D two D, you know. Uh, there's a cute like letter initials and numbers, and there it works. It works. We went for the for the short and uh, and cutesy name. Um, and yeah, so that name was on the on the list that Emmanuel, our uh, our CEO, uh, put together, uh, or Leon, and I think it's the maybe the only one really all liked. And the relation to books it comes from reeds. So reeds were what were used to make papyrus, one of the early earlier instruments for writing. Uh, so that's that's your link to publishing there, and so it turned into Reedsy. And since we were in that whole um, Egyptian hieroglyph vibe, our designer, Matt, uh, made our logo out of uh, the Egyptian hieroglyph for writing. And it turned it, he turned it into a parrot because why wouldn't you turn it into a parrot? Exactly. <laughs> I know so when I think of parrots, go. I think of Reedsy. <sighs> Reedsy.com. Me too. <laughs> so we're getting towards the end of the show. We try to keep these to about 45 minutes. So I know there's a couple of questions we didn't get to, but we'll try to answer some of those in the comments where we can. Um, this will be available for you to watch later on if you want to, and especially if you got friends that weren't here to see it live. Um, want to end with Amanda saying, Ricardo has the Hobbit behind him. Now I like him even better. The Hobbit, it's a great thing. Great book. Ricardo's a really cool guy. Reads the, um, yeah, I've just really been impressed with. Uh, you guys started maybe around the same time that Draft the Digital did, maybe a little bit later. Um, so, yeah. I've so, known Ricardo now for, I don't know, 
five, six years. It seems you were just like a, a baby. Like he had no facial hair. I was like, can this guy even drive? And now like Reezy's just been doing great. I've seen him at conferences all over the world. Um, you know, we're trying to use this time with our spotlight to highlight people we know that we trust and that we hear back from authors that they've really made a difference in their careers. So I, I highly encourage you to check out both Reedsy as a marketplace, but Reedsy um, for all of the free stuff that they offer because it's a lot. Uh, do you have any closing words, Mr. Ricardo Fayette? No, thank you so much. I mean, so, so many kind words. Uh, you're, you're my number one, uh, you're my number one marketing person when it comes to promoting RTS conferences. <laughs> I so, know like, I need to get like my own business cards for that. So like when I'm representing yeah. Reedsy, when you're late, so Ricardo is fashionably late to all of the events he throws at conferences. Yeah. I was really afraid he's going to show up five to 10 minutes late for this <laughs> because he is just fashionably late. I guess the European thing. I don't know. Yeah. It's uh, I don't want to, yeah, no, I don't want to show, shine a bad light on Europeans. I'll, I'll say it's, it's my thing. thing. It's a Ricardo thing. But I mean, I did show up like five minutes late to the kind of rehearsal, you know, pre, pre live thing. So that counts. But you made it. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we will see you tomorrow if you want to. We've got uh, content scheduled all this week and we're looking at content for next week. Uh, tomorrow we have Corey from Book Brush. Thursday, I believe we have Will from Find Away Voices to talk about audiobooks. Uh, Book Brush, if you don't know, uh, helps you make social media graphics, and it's awesome. Um, and then Friday, we're looking at having uh, someone from BookBub on so they can answer some more of the marketing questions because they know a ton about marketing. So thanks for having us. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Thank you.